Watson has come a long way from playing Jeopardy. What can you tell us about the innovations, the technical innovations that have been introduced since the Jeopardy days? Well, I think as you saw in the video clip and, and, uh, um, and in the, in the, the, uh, the subsequent uh, marketing video is, you know, we, we've been working on how to expand on the technologies that were in the, uh, in the Jeopardy match. You know, I think when you look at the Jeopardy system, what you saw was a system that was really good at answering one question for one user in a very short amount of time, yep. right? Um, uh, and using it, you know, and one of the things we had to do in the game was use an electromechanical me thumb yes. uh, in the process just to keep it a little bit fairer. But um, so since then, we started to look at the, the ideas of, of this Q&A engine, which was really natural language processing, machine learning, and, and hypothesis generation based on a, a large amount of data. And one of the things that a, a lot of people didn't realize about the, the game is that it wasn't connected to the Internet. It had to be an autonomous right. uh, knowledge base at the time. So we started to look at this idea of Q&A and its application to different business scenarios, industries, professions. Uh, and, and we looked a lot at healthcare, as has been documented a lot. Uh, because it's an industry that, as you would say, is ripe for an exponential disruption right. uh, because Great. of the amount of information that's being produced. So we started to look at that and realized that Q&A was just a piece of the puzzle. Right? Yeah. It, it was a component in a system, a cognitive system that had to evolve. And we started looking at um, making it more robust, making it faster, making it smaller. The, you know, the, the bedroom size system that played uh, in the Jeopardy match is now about the size of three pizza boxes. So right. it's a lot of engineering work that's gone on. But the, in addition to Q&A, we started to realize that you know, the world isn't just about questions and answers. It's really about problems. Yes. And so we started working uh, with Cleveland Clinic on the idea of a reasoning engine that could take a problem statement and break it apart into its various components and ask the Q&A engine questions about the right. problem and start to reason through what you would call today differential diagnosis with the medical students. Uh, we, we started to recognize there were other surrounding problems, uh, massive amounts of information being generated about individual patients. Right. Um, you know, in the IT industry, we've been focused on the back office of healthcare for a long time, so we've been creating these electronic medical records. Uh, and at Cleveland Clinic, they were getting to be hundreds of pages long. Uh, and I think we all recognize that doctors that are practicing medicine don't have time to read a 200-page EMR between okay. patients as they do rounds. So we ended up creating a summarization engine using the, the Watson engine to go through all the nurses' notes and the doctors' notes to start to create a one-page synopsis of what's going on in, in those. So what I'm trying to get across is that we've recognized it's not a Q&A engine, it's a piece of a system, and the system's going to have many components and those components have been under development for the last few years. Right. What can you say about the Watson ecosystem now? All right. Well, I think um, as we developed this out, we realized that while IBM would, you know, by our nature, focus on you know, big industries and, and big enterprises, that really for this technology to take off, it, it really needed that level of democratization that, uh, that Peter talked about. And so we opened up this idea of, a, of an ecosystem platform in, in late last year uh, and, and really got started in early this year, um, opening up the APIs to let entrepreneurs start to try their own applications. And they haven't let us down. They, they're coming up with ideas that I wouldn't have thought of. They're not the things that um, you know, we would typically think of or do at IBM. So it was, it was a great um, lesson for us that opening up and becoming the platform for the entrepreneurial world is a great way to help move the state of the art forward. Um, you know, a great example of that would be the idea of a personal shopper on the right. front of an e-commerce system, right? I mean, right. We, we've automated e-commerce sites for decades, yeah. right? But basically, we do catalog shopping on the internet. Yes. We lost that personal shopper that helps us fill the cart, right? right? Or uh, you could same thing about travel agents, right? Yeah. And travel or um, starting to think about, uh, you know, advisors that help you stay healthy as opposed to how it helps you, right. you know, when you get sick. So we're starting to see a bunch of these different applications come out now. So walk us through a use case. Uh, when a customer comes to you, uh, how would they develop a Watson application? Well, it really depends on the domain, right? So but let's, let's, um, let's pick a simple one, like uh, a call center, for example, right? Uh, call centers are a, a business function that almost every company has in one form or another, whether it's just a, a couple of people in the back room or whether it's hundreds of people in, in big call centers. Um, we start to see this idea of 
call centers being places people go to answer questions, right? And, and Watson's quite good at answering questions uh, and reasoning through those kind of problems. So uh, they'll come in, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to them about, you know, what kind of data do they have? What's the domain? Um, you know, a lot, of these, a lot of these systems, you start talking about the data and you talk about data for a long time, right? Where's it coming from? How accurate is it? How do you curate it? How do we keep it up to date? Uh, and it's really the, the most complicated part of any of these, these new systems is the knowledge base itself. Um, once you identify the, the content, we work with clients to ingest the content and train the content, and then we build an app. It's actually the reverse of the way that we build apps today. Right. Today we get requirements, we build an app, we find some data, we test it, we put it out, let everybody use it. Right. Um, here you actually work on the information and testing of the knowledge base for a long period of time, and the app is actually pretty straightforward. Right. So if a member of this audience wanted to use Watson, uh, what steps would they go through? How would well, they get engaged? Well, if they're, if they're an entrepreneur, the ecosystem's open, right? So it's just contact us through, uh, through our website. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll start to hook you up with the APIs and the developer platform and, and help you get started like uh, many others have. Um, we just recently ran a uh, mobile application developer right. challenge uh, that our uh, chairman and CEO announced at the Mobile World Congress in Bar Barcelona. And, and what was fascinating, even though Jeopardy! was a U.S.-based game show, uh, we had applications from 43 countries yes. uh, to work on uh, mobile applications working with Watson. Uh, and over the course of two months, uh, we took the applications, we went through them, we selected 25 uh, semifinalists, we, we narrowed that down to five finalists, and, and last week we announced uh, the three winners. Right? And the three winners are actually going to get access to IBM development and consulting help from, from Watson and, and our digital agency to build out businesses around their ideas and applications uh, and, and hopefully to launch later this year. So just another example of how we're reaching out to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, the second thing that uh, members of the audience might be from one of the large enterprises that we do business with, uh, when we announced the ecosystem for uh, entrepreneurs, uh, we got a lot of phone calls from our friends in the enterprises saying, what about us? Right. Right. We, we, want, we want to write applications too. Um, so we extended the um, the developer cloud to, to enterprises, creating sandboxes for enterprises that are interested. We announced that a few weeks ago. Uh, and then most recently, we decided to extend the ecosystem out to universities. Yes. Right. Yeah. So what can you tell us about the Watson University system? Well, what, what we did is it came out of, you know, I started doing, you know, as you do, lectures on campus, you know, my, and, and in, in this case, my daughter is a student at Michigan, so I, uh, she asked me to come out and give a lecture to her class, so I, like a good dad, I said yes. Uh, I think that's the only acceptable answer. Right. But um, when I gave it, I, I was amazed by the amount of just interest from all the students in what had transpired with, Jep uh, with the Watson system since Jeopardy and, and their knowledge of it. Uh, and their intrigue uh, about what might be possible with it. And so I was talking to one of the professors there that day, and he said, well, you should teach a course, right? And that kind of planted a seed. And, and by the time we got back to New York that night, we'd laid out a semester-long senior-level course in um, starting with kind of content theory and, and information theory, information testing, application building, and business, business case building. Right. Uh, then we started approaching some uh, key universities, um, so RPI, NYU, Carnegie Mellon, Michigan, Ohio State, UT Austin, Berkeley, so just to name a few, that um, were interested, and they've all signed up. And, uh, and yesterday I was actually down with the professors in Austin as they were going through uh, boot camp on, uh, on Watson, getting ready for the class to start in the fall. Right, in, in one of the universities' case, they, when they announced the class, it, it filled up instantly with 70 students, and they had 50 people on the waiting list trying to get Great. in. So, you know, the interest is out there in the universities. And, and our hope here is that we're going to generate a new generation of entrepreneurs. They're going to graduate in a year. They're going to come out. They've, they've already got some experience with AI systems, and they'll be part of that ecosystem that you're talking about that will be fueling the next generation of innovations. It's really excellent. What can you tell us about um, the integration, perhaps future integration, with Darmendra Moda's work on the Synapse project? Well, I think, uh, you know, as you showed, the Synapse project is, is really kind of an orthogonal set of thinking yeah. on how to do chip architectures um, in, in so many different ways, right? Uh, and, you know, I think on your first chart, you had something called brain-inspired architectures yes. at the bottom. And that's really what the logic was that uh, Darmendra and team went through is um, how come the machine that played Jeopardy took so much electricity and the human brain takes 27 watts, 
right? So there was an imbalance there. And he, they started to, to look at the, the architecture of the brain. They started to think about the fact that the way bits flip in the brain is with a synapse firing, right? right? But a synapse doesn't have to fire. It's not an electrical circuit that runs continuously. It's just a, a quick moment of time. Right. And he started focusing on that. And we've started building out uh, the, the correlate programming language that you talked about. I, I've seen some of the example applications that yes. they've built on them. They're, they're quite fascinating, very yes. early stage stuff. Right. But um, I think as we start to see that evolve, we'll, we'll probably start to see it evolve as a companion processor, maybe a GPU processor mm -hmm. for, for systems. Like uh, a co-processor. A co-processor, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, we'll, um, and then we'll see it evolve from there. But the, the differences in power consumption are just amazing. And as we look at um, these cognitive systems evolving and the amount of information that we're producing and I think that the tsunami chart you had up was very apt. Um, you know, people are going to get swallowed up in the information. We're going to need different ways of approaching it and, and, you know, novel approaches to architectures like that I think are a way to do it. Mm -hmm. What are you most excited about when you look at extensions to Watson from where it is today? Well, I think it's, it's, on, it's on the cusp of going from an interesting standalone thing to something that's going to start to be integrated into many things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really kind of the tipping point, to, to use that analogy, of, of how things really get moving in the market. Um, you know, so I used the call center example a little bit earlier. You know, this week we're, uh, we're announcing a partnership with Genesis, which is one of the leading uh, call center uh, software providers. Yes. And, and at their GeForce conference in New Orleans two weeks ago, we demonstrated Watson integration into their client experience suite, the answering questions. Right? But what was interesting about it is that it wasn't answering questions by itself. It answers questions to a point, but you can program the system so it knows when to bring the human into the conversation and create a hot transfer, if you will, of the conversation in flight yes. to the call center specialist because it's really about the systems augmenting and scaling intelligence as opposed to replacing intelligence. And this, this combination is really important. Do you agree with the take I had on the Turing test announcement? Yeah, I think the, the way to think about the Turing test uh, announcement is, it, you know, in a sense of wonder in, in some level, right? Yeah. Um, but it, it's really pointing out an area that we're working a lot at right now uh, in the Watson team, which is conversational dialogue, right? right? And conversational dialogue systems, uh, we've all interacted with them for years. You know, we pick up the phone and we call and it says, press one for this number, <laughs> press two for this number, press three for this number. Yes. And they've evolved. Right. Uh, it's now um, tag recognition instead of numbers, but right. it's the same directed dialogue right. approach. And what we see happening with these cognitive systems is the people we're working with, they want to get into a conversation. They don't right. want to search for a list of documents. Yes. They want to ask questions and they want to get answers. But these systems have to evolve so that not only can it give an answer, but it can also ask clarifying questions back and it can carry context over from one question to the next. So this area of conversational dialogue, I think, is ripe for a lot of progress in the industry. I think it's one of the core enabling technologies for cognitive systems. I, I would use the analogy, it's very similar to um, the break between DOS and Windows, where we went yeah. from line-based text computers to graphical interfaces. Uh, and, and Windows was fairly crude in its, in its early stages, but evolved to what we have today. And I think we're gonna see conversational dialogue systems go through a rapid set of evolution yes. now on the front end of these cognitive systems. And they're really gonna make information more approachable. I don't want to say computers more approachable because it's really, the computers are just a mechanism to get to the information. What humans want to interact with is the world around them and the information that is contained in that world. Right, yeah, I agree. So IBM has a billion dollars that they have <laughs> allocated to the Watson business. What does the Watson organization look like today? And uh, what do you see as the key components of that business going forward. Yeah, I, I think it's important to understand what we did between Jeopardy and the beginning of this year. And um, what, what we were focused on is with any new emerging technology, you need to do some market validation, right? right? You, you can, you know, we've, we've all watched too many companies pour a lot of money into hot new ideas that, you know, in, in essence don't go anywhere. Right. So we wanted to work with uh, half a dozen or so leading customers that wanted to be on the bleeding edge of things, research institutions, doctors, et cetera. Uh, to really test the technology and, and help us drive the engineering, which is what we did uh, in kind of an isolated startup mode within the company and as part of my, my early organization. 
As we decided the technology was ready to start to commercialize last year, um, we, we looked at it, we put together a business plan like any organization right. would, and uh, uh, I came up with the idea that a you know, billion dollars is a nice round number and it would be a well-funded startup at that point. Uh, and we created, the, uh, we created the group and we set it up like a startup inside the company. We, we, we integrated it uh, vertically, so all of the consulting teams, research teams, development teams, um, uh, sales and marketing teams are all part of, of the organization, so it's a tightly integrated group, much like a startup would be. Um, and we started to add staff. Um, we, uh, we moved about a dozen startups worth of research projects out of IBM Research into the core group that we thought were on the cusp of getting ready to go into commercialization. So we've yes. been digesting that uh, set of acquisitions uh, over the last few months. Uh, and we're starting to build that out into a platform. Uh, as we, we talked about the early Q&A APIs being available right. on the platform now, what we'll see is uh, the, the Watson APIs will, will continue to be added to, new capabilities around context and understanding the people that are using the system, things like real-time translation, et cetera, will yes. start to become part of the platform. But, and, and then the platform will be part of uh, IBM's overall cloud strategy with, with Bluemix on SoftLayer. And, and so a way to expand globally around all the data centers we're putting in in parallel. So we really have a set of parallel investments going on between um, the expansion of our cloud infrastructure with SoftLayer on a global basis, the, uh, uh, the introduction of our uh, platform as a service, Bluemix, and right. then uh, the cognitive capabilities starting to come into that environment for applications. Many of the apps that we're seeing aren't just cognitive. Cognitive is a piece of the application, but things like predictive analytics, and you talked about R, and, um, and understanding the big data and the, yes. um, the things that are not necessarily unstructured data, but the structured data. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of talk in the industry these days about you know, Hadoop and unstructured right. data, the traditional databases are going away. They're growing like crazy yes. right now. The amount of systems are just uh, uh, exponential. One last question. How about the impact of Watson on the financial industry? We've talked about not computers <coughs> for people, computers and people. How do you see it? Well, a couple of key areas are popping up. One, one is financial institutions have a lot of clients. Uh, and as their client base continues to expand on a global basis, how do they reach those clients? How do they answer questions for those clients? How do they improve the customer experience on a 7 by 24 basis? Uh, we, we see a lot of application of that, and we work with a number of financial institutions on helping people understand the options and choices they have based on very well-produced um, information, so well-structured information that can be ingested in these systems and, and, and can really start to scale and augment uh, the capabilities of, of their own information systems today. The, the second one that we're uh, very excited about and working with a, a, a few leading institutions on is this idea of uh, scaling and augmenting wealth management. Right, and, and there's a lot of products out there for people to buy. There's a lot of investments that are happening. Those investments are influenced by things that are going on in the world around us. Uh, information coming out from companies, from news reporters, from CNBC. Um, th those influence investment choices. And um, wealth managers have a limited number of human clients that they can deal with. What if we could actually give them a set of tools that allowed their clients to interact with the system part of the time, the humans part of the time, and together they could actually scale to a much broader reach. We, we think that's a great use case for this technology. Great. Mike, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Please thank Mike Roden.